This episode is brought to you by Vonage. Your business needs more than an 800 number. With Vonage Voice API, you can provide the call experience your customers expect and get the data your team needs. From call analytics and virtual assistance to automatic speech recognition and text-to-speech in multiple languages. Your customer service team can help more people in more places. And with in-app voice, your customers can easily contact you the moment they have a question. Take your calls to the next level with Vonage Voice API. Learn more at Vonage.com. Scott for Scott's here. Do you hear that? Bring the mic in close. That's not how the grass should sound. There's weeds everywhere on this lawn. It's time to take action with Scott's Turf Builder Triple Action. It gets three jobs done at once, kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and feeds your lawn so it keeps growing strong. Ah, much better. Get a bag of Scott's Triple Action today. It's guaranteed or your money back. Feed your lawn. Feed it. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 408, Operation Pedestal, One Hell of an Afternoon. Last time, we covered the first half of August 12th, a day that saw blood drawn from both sides, and the day wasn't over yet. Just at noon, some of the convoy's escorts managed to chase away U-205, while earlier, a Sunderland reconnaissance plane managed to help damage an Italian sub, the Bryn, enough so that she had to head for eastern Spain, but that had just been the warm-up. For soon, the Italians would take the lead in trying to sink the convoy, and given their less-than-thoroughness, shall we say, they threw in everything that included the kitchen sink. First, the numbers alone would determine that something would get through. After all, this attack represented nearly every plane on Sardinia. Next, the attack, when it came, was to have been a mixture, a cocktail, if you will, of all the different ways to attack surface ships. Bombing, dive bombing, strafing, and of course, the subs and U-boats were still around. More specifically, here's the Italian's recipe to sink pedestal. Phase 1 was designed to cause maximum confusion for the escorts. This would cause the convoy to break into smaller formations to try to maximize protection. And if this worked, then the torpedo bombers would have an easier time of it. First, 10 S-84 bombers from 32 Stormo, or 32nd Wing, would come in, each one carrying two Motobomba FFs. This weapon was the real deal, something that gave Germany envy and the Allies nightmares. Basically, the FF was a torpedo that could be programmed. It was dropped in the water via a parachute, and it would go around in concentric circles. The circle size was adjustable. The torpedo weighs 350 kilograms or 770 pounds, and its warhead is about 120 kilograms or 260 pounds and it will circle at 40 knots for 15 to 30 minutes for whenever it's set. Obviously, the plan was to drop 20 of these in front of the approaching convoy, but as convenient as it would be to hope that each and every Allied ship was destroyed, the Italians were more focused on the confusion, the chaos that these random explosions could cause, than actual kills. And while the convoy was dodging these circling killers... Fiat Falcon fighter bombers would come in low and attack the destroyers, the backbone of the escorts. When all this was said and done, hopefully the torpedo bomber formations, and yes, there would be many, would have a relatively easy time of finishing off what was ever left. The only flaw in this plan was that the torpedo bombers were obsolete Fiat CR-42 Falcons. They were roughly on par with the Gloucester Gladiator, but... It was hoped that with all the confusion, their job would be relatively straightforward. And as their bomb capacity was only 200 pounds, again, the Italians were hoping these devices would be more distracting than deadly. And protecting these bombers would be several Maquis 202 fighters, easily on par, if not better than, the sea hurricanes they would be going up against. Alas, All that planning was made less impactful due to the lack of coordination. 
The idea was to have torpedoes circling around, causing panic, then for several formations of planes of various types to attack, all at the same time, from different directions, to get in close for the kill. It would be simple, straightforward, with all those targets in the air shooting and being shot at, and with all those submarines in the air sending out torpedoes, hopefully some bomb, some bullet, or some torpedo would get through. And then the real numbers of pedestal would start to dwindle, leaving fewer ships each time they were focused on. But again, alas, that did not happen as the various formations came right in after each other, and not simultaneously. Still, it was bad enough, but it could have been so much worse. The first formation to come in at 12.15 p.m. was Colonel Leone and his 132 Storma, or Wing. They had 24 S-84 planes, and each one had two of the Moto Bombas. Leon and his men dropped their swirling torpedoes, and they did this only three kilometers ahead of the lead ship. So by the time the S-84s flew away, two would not make it back to Sardinia due to damage from AA guns and air attacks. But every remaining plane that attacked would have some level of damage, and so they would not be participating in any more attacks in the near future. That had not been a part of the plan. But the good news continued for the defenders. One of the lost S-84s was shot down by a sea hurricane from one of the carriers. Further, the crashing plane let all those of pedestal know that something was going on up ahead of them. And some of the Italian planes had dropped their motobombas faster than planned for. This was witnessed by the lead escorts. So, as the Italian planes flew away, the convoy, as one, turned 45 degrees to port and then again to starboard, thus avoiding these circles of death. Within 15 minutes, most, if not all, of the motobombas were heard exploding as their time was up. Based on the true story that shocked the world. I am- Critics are calling A Spy Among Friends on MGM Plus a thrilling new Cold War drama. Treason. That's what I'm accusing you of. With spellbinding performances. I am not a traitor! Starring Emmy Award winners Damian Lewis and Guy Pearce. You're trying to get me killed. Give me one reason why not. I know some. A Spy Among Friends. Watch now, only on MGM Plus. Not that it was that easy. As the ships of Pedestal were turning, three Fiat CR-42s flew overhead, about mast high. These three invaders had been a group of eight originally, but Martlets from the Indomitable's 806 Squadron had reduced their numbers. Still, the survivors came on and dropped their loads, though all missed. Just after the ships steamed around the Motobombas, the second large air attack got underway. Keep in mind, this attack was to have happened as the same time as the first. Still, it was a respectable threat that now came at pedestal. 33 Savoia Marchetti Sparrows, or SM-79s, and 10 S-84s, acting as torpedo carriers, were on their way. These bombers were escorted by 26 RE-2001s. Fortunately for the Allies, The defending fighters, who were already in the air, engaged and entangled with the 10 S-84 torpedo planes, who never made it to any of their target ships. But the 33 medium bomber sparrows did reach pedestal. Yet, as the last part of their approach forced them to fly level and steady, the destroyers tore into them with their deck guns. But some of the Italian pilots were brave, and they flew through this wall of lead. Yet it must be said that all the attacking planes dropped their torpedoes at least 8,000 yards from their intended ship, so no ships were lost, having plenty of time to react. It was the battleship Nelson that had the scariest moment. When a sparrow was coming right at it, not only did the plane drop its torpedo, but it seemed that the pilot was guessing that he was already dead. So he aimed his plane at the Nelson. 
But again, the battleship's crew reacted. The torpedo missed, and the plane went down with lots of bullets in it, but it missed the Nelson as well. With that, this air attack was over. The Italians had lost one SM-79, two S-84s, and one fighter. For their pains, they sank nothing. Not that it was over. Far from it. As the Italians flew away, 37 Junker Ju-88s now approached. But before they came into range of the ships below, one Fulmar from 809 Squadron, having left the Victorious, approached 16 of these 88s from behind, all alone. The bomber that he first approached dropped its payload and dove away. The Fulmar went after him, but the counterfire from the Junkers 88 was too much. The Fulmar backed off. And as if a signal had been given... The fighting in the air became a melee, what with the JUs coming in, met by eight fighters from 809 and 885 squadrons. Wisely, the Germans not only broke into groups of four or twelve, but dropped their bombs from differing heights. Thus, the fighters had to pick which groups to go after and which to ignore. This way, of the original 37 Junkers, twelve got through the destroyer screen. It was 1.18 p.m. The Germans had crossed over the convoy on its starboard side, and at 3,000 feet, they started their attack. Both battleships, the Nelson and Rodney, had near misses, as did the Cairo and several merchantmen. But as the German planes flew over the four columns of ship, they got their bearing down as they approached the last column on the far left. One such Junkers went after the Decalion, with Master Captain Ramsey Brown in command, and the plane dropped four sticks of explosives. The Ducalion was the lead ship in the far left column. One stick exploded to starboard, and two to port, but the fourth stick struck true. Within seconds, the number five hold was flooded. Right away, the freighter slowed down, with the other ships passing by her. Two of her lifeboats were soon launched, and these men were thinking she was a goner. Equally quickly, Vice Admiral Seifert ordered the destroyer Brahman to stand by and render assistance. Those two captains, Brown and Baines, of the Brahman, talked, and within 30 minutes, the Deucalion's engines exploded back into life. The lifeboats were soon recovered, and the freighter was doing eight knots. As this was her best speed, and only being left further behind by pedestal, the damaged freighter and her destroyer escort were told to take a route closer to the Tunisian coast. And this worked, for a while, until they were later spotted by German aircraft. But fighters from the Indomitable and Victorious did sterling work this day. But they also found out the disadvantage of being outnumbered. Two pilots, Lieutenant Patterson and Lieutenant R. L. Johnston, chased down enemy bombers, only to be jumped themselves by other waiting enemy fighters. In Johnston's case, he was the leader of Squadron 806. He and his plane had been hit with enemy bullets. As he tried to land, his arrestor hook malfunctioned, and his plane went over the side with Johnston in it. He was not recovered. Meanwhile, other martlets of 806 Squadron were busy chasing four JU-88s. The Junkers got away, but the British planes found a CANT Z-1007B medium bomber on their way home. Two of the Italian crewmen managed to parachute out before the plane crashed into the sea. And now, it's time for a bit of Italian magic, or more realistically, Italian Imagination. The next air attack, an Italian affair, had a special surprise for the two remaining carriers. A standard SM-79 bomber was packed with tons of explosives. One very brave pilot took off with it, but then set the aircraft on a set course and next bailed out. Another pilot in a nearby plane took radio control over the bomber. It had become a flying bomb, and it was meant to take out a carrier. The flying bomb and the Cant Z-1007B controlling it were protected by five fighters. 
And yet, it was 1942, and controlling something by radio signals was in its infancy. As the flying bomb came ever closer to the two carriers, the crew on the other plane lost control of it. The SM-79, packed with explosives, simply flew on until it ran out of fuel. It would crash in the mountains of Algeria. Fortunately, the plane was utterly destroyed and the secret Italian weapon was kept safe. But the Italians had another surprise in store for the British-led convoy. We've already seen the motobombas and the flying bomb. The next and last weapon from the Italian imagination was an armor-piercing bomb that could be dropped from a low height, guaranteeing accuracy from a fast-moving plane, improving the odds of the pilot safely getting away. But, as with the flying bomb, something went wrong with these bombs when they were tested. So the Italians would try another trick, this one relying more on sleight of hand versus cutting-edge technology. Two of the RE-2001 fighters managed to slip into a formation that was heading back to the Victorious. As they reached a point over her, they watched as two legitimate Sea Hurricanes landed. Then the two Italian planes dove down for the carrier. As they zoomed past the flight deck, everyone on board just assumed they were celebrating, having chased away the enemy that morning. Instead of showing off, they released several anti-personnel fragmentation bombs. They went skidding across the deck, and then they exploded. One bomb went off on the deck and sent splinters outward as it was supposed to. The other detonated just off the carrier's bow. In all, four officers and two men of the carrier were now dead, with two more being injured. The tactic to get the planes into place was nothing short of brilliant. The actual attack was disappointing. Still, the two RE-2001s managed to get away. Such was the surprise achieved on the gun crews. This is how the air raids from Sardinia ended. The fear and potential loss had been staggering. The actual damage done was minuscule. This episode is brought to you by Circle. Circle is building a digital dollar that's backed one-to-one. It's where crypto meets stability, where local businesses meet global customers, and the U.S. dollar meets USDC. Visit circle.com slash Spotify. Now it's time for the enemy submarines to move in. For the next two hours, the ASDEC contacts will be so numerous and regular that Vice Admiral Seifert had the 19th Destroyer Flotilla drop a depth charge every 10 minutes if they were on the outside of the escort screen. At 2.17 p.m., the destroyer Tartar spotted a sub on the surface, charged after it, and dropped a pattern of charges where it submerged. The Zetlin was about to chase another sub when it was ordered back into position. The sub had been too far away to really threaten the convoy, and each destroyer was needed in case those planes returned. At 4.16 p.m., the destroyer Pathfinder had an ASDIC contact and harassed the would-be convoy killer. Not to be outdone, the over-eager Zetlin joined in. Soon, they would not learn this until much later, the Italian crew on the sub Cobalto had blood coming from their ears. The depth charge attack had been that close and that successful. The Cobalto simply sat there, letting the convoy go by, hoping they would be spared. After the enemy ships had passed, the sub came to the surface to effect repairs which is when she was spotted by the destroyer Ethereal, led by Lieutenant Commander D.H. Maitland McKill Crichton. The sub went down again, though the crew was loath to, but when she came up a second time, Maitland had had enough. He went full speed, his 4.7-inch gun blazing, but in the end, the destroyer simply ran over the surfaced sub. The crew of the Ethereal saved three Italian officers, and one of those was the captain, and she also saved 38 ratings. Unfortunately, there had been no time to retrieve any paperwork. The sub went down that fast. 
The ethereal could now only do 20 knots, given her damage, and as she tried to return to her position within the convoy, she was set upon by a Ju-88 and four CR-42 fighter bombers. Soon the bombs were coming down, but Maitland's crew had the experience to steer clear of the falling objects. Of course, the Italians on board his ship, who had already been depth-charged numerous times and then rammed, just wanted this day to be over. As a bonus, with the Ethereal being attacked, there were that fewer airplanes to go after the convoy. The destroyer and her crew were just doing their job. Next, the sub Emo attacked the convoy at 4.04 p.m. Its captain had spotted 29 ships out there, but the one that had caught his eye was the nearest carrier. For the next 20 minutes, the Emo moved around and finally positioned herself near the carrier. Suddenly, the convoy shifted its course, and in a matter of seconds, there were a cruiser and several destroyers between the sub and its target. Not wanting to lose his position, the sub-captain decided to go after the cruiser, a respectable prize, at 4.43 p.m. The Emo launched all four bow torpedoes from 2,000 meters away. A few minutes later, the captain heard an explosion, and then two more. Surely the cruiser was on her way to the bottom. But hindsight allows us to know that the fish missed and detonated when crossing a ship's wake. However, the torpedo wakes had been spotted by the Tartar, and she moved in to attack. Soon the Tartar was joined by the lookout, who had also spotted the periscope just before it went under. The Ema would get away, but she had made no kill either. For the next hour, the Emo moved slowly away, hoping none of those explosions would go off near her. But what the Emo could not know was that some of those explosions were aimed at another sub that had moved into the area when the Emo was pushed away. That other sub was the Ovorio. She had come upon the convoy at 5.08 p.m. and saw before her steamers, destroyers, battleships, and an American-looking carrier. The sub's captain, Vassello, knew his hydrophones were not working, but his periscope told him all he needed to know. The destroyers were 12,000 meters away, the two freighters were 15,000 meters away, and the battleships were 18,000 meters away. And for whatever reason, Captain Vassello decided to go after the battleship, which was furthest from him, in calm waters, and he had no hydrophone. Still, he ordered his sub to move into position. But it was that relatively calm water that allowed the two destroyers to detect him. Soon they were charging at him, for which he ordered the sub to dive. At 5.30 p.m., the depth charge attack was particularly intense. There was only one option, to go further down. After going down 100 meters, he and his were pretty safe from the attack. But then again, they couldn't go anywhere. So Vassello sat there for the next five hours. When he surfaced at 10.25 p.m., the convoy and its escorts were gone. Staying on the surface, Vassello headed north, recharging his batteries as he went. No, the day had not been a success, but they were able to walk away from their encounter, so chalked it up as a win. Back at 4.35 p.m., the sub Dandolo, captained by another Vassello, approached the convoy. By 6 p.m., he was close enough to pick out particular ships. But as close as he was, the convoy kept zigzagging, messing up his plant shots. And then his luck ran out as the Dandolo was spotted and attacked at 6.30 p.m. Soon the Italian sub was forced to flee for safety. So far, the defending escorts had done good work. The enemy had lost more than they took. But it was about to get a lot harder. First, Vice Admiral Seifert announced that at 7.15 p.m., the larger ships would turn around. They could not be lost, as it would leave the home island vulnerable. Also, that the destroyer Wilton would be joining Force X to get the convoy the rest of the way to Malta. Meanwhile, fighter patrols reported a large buildup of enemy aircraft about 30 miles away. 
Clearly, they were rounding up various squadrons from Sicily and other places to bring them all together to then launch an overwhelming attack. No sense in waiting. The two carriers threw up 22 aircraft to go harass the enemy formation before it came this way. And this had not been easy as Victorious was having issues with her lifts, which were needed to bring up or take down planes to get them out of the way. The pilots, like everyone else, had been at this for 12 hours now, and they were seen gobbling down sandwiches and drinking tea as they ran for their planes for another time that day. For panic was in the air. Either these two carriers could put up enough planes to save the day, or they would not. It didn't bear thinking about. So everyone just kept busy. As the pilots washed the last of their food down, as their air crews checked over their charges to make sure they would do well this day, the gun crews aboard every ship, but certainly the 13 merchantmen, went over their guns, made sure they were ready to go, and had plenty of ammunition to hand. Because as many cartridges and shells had been used so far, they weren't even at the Narrows yet. This evening was going to be anything but tranquil. There was a good chance that some of these men, hell, these ships, would not be here in the morning. All that could be done was to check your weapon, say your prayer, and hope that luck was close by. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I just want to do something I haven't done in a while. I want to say hello to some members and thank people that have donated. These aren't all the names, but I'll just do a group each time until I get caught up. So sorry about that, guys. Um, so let's see here. As far as members, some of the latest members are Daniel Blass from Quebec, Canada, David Buckingham from City Beach, Western Australia, and sorry, David, I don't know why I took so long to get that out. Uh, John Carr from Katy, Texas. As far as those who have made donations, there's J. Patrick Heller, Paul Kelly, and again, John Carr from Texas. Thank you, John, very much. Um, I got a really nice email from a Chris C. Gaskins from Cedar Park, Texas. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Uh, I also got an email from an Ed Carr in Austin, Texas. He works at the Texas Military Forces Museum. So now I need to go back there and drive or fly to Texas because I got to check that out. Ed, thank you for telling me about that. And my last one is Stan Favre, who helped me with the pronounce, pronouncing the Sardinia places. Thank you, Stan. I used to listen to your email. I'm like, oh, that's how you say it. And then I probably butchered the words anyway. So, Anyway, thank you for listening. I'll be back with the next episode uh, as they're about to head into the Narrows, and it's about to get very intense for everyone involved. Take care, everyone. What a beautiful day in nature. Boy, do I feel capital A alive. Luckily for you humans, Nature's Way put that thrilling feeling of aliveness in a bottle. Nature's Way Alive Multivitamin Gummies. Delicious multivitamins inspired by nature. Nature's Way.